everyone and welcome to the fifth episode of Farming Fast and Slow. I am taking over today from Adam Wolf and we have a special guest, Ian Smetona from Newnham's Vegetable Seed. And before that, Ian had worked at Luminera Company and LA and SF Specialty. And I'm excited about to have a conversation about breeding, what's coming next in the vegetable and specialty crop space to restaurants. Um, and with that, Ian, I wanted to turn it over to you to learn more about how you got into agriculture and your, what I consider a dream job at Newnham's. <laughs> yeah, so um, like anything else, it was uh, just kind of out of necessity initially. Um, I got into sales after football, my football career ended and um, had a pathway into uh, in a food service through my dad, who um, he uh, writes restaurant software for uh, back of house, um, the point of sale terminal, uh, his company made all that, uh, made the software that that took the data entered at the terminal, took it into the back and uh, broke out all the recipes for costing menu costing and all that. So he was working with a company called claim jumper and Landry's. Um, and through a number of connections that are kind of boring. Um, I was able to get in with LA and San Francisco specialty, uh, one of the largest produce companies at the time. And uh, that was 2000, 2011. Um, and then got into food, um, got into cooking, working with a lot of different, you know, high end chefs, quick service restaurants, hotels, resorts, and uh, it just kind of took off from there. So um, I got really into cooking, um, really into nutrition, um, you know, running a restaurant, working with different chefs, uh, farmers markets. Um, I even got exposed to a lot of higher end groceries. So charcuterie, specialty cheeses, uh, oils, vinegars, um, you know, all those different types of high end items as well. So uh, broadened me really, really well. Um, did that grind for about seven years. And uh, once we started having kids, the 5 a.m. Sunday morning, uh, <laughs> angry phone calls from chefs that they were out of potatoes. Um, the wife wasn't really uh, into that anymore. So the late night texts, the early morning, um, you know, just having 180 different, you know, accounts that I was working with. It's like having other relationships basically because they're just, you know, chefs are very demanding. Um, restaurants are very demanding. Uh, margins are tight. Uh, very, very competitive. So if you've got delivery issues, quality issues, they want it fixed, you know, they wanted it fixed 20 minutes ago. So um, that got old. I started looking further up the chain um, into the growers and Lee Monera was a grower that I had worked with at been a, a farm tour at when I was at LA and San Francisco specialty. They had an opening for like a retail uh, sales representative. So it was working with um, Costco, Aldi, Trader Joe's, Kroger, Safeway, Albertsons, um, working on their lemon and citrus contracts. So got in, did that, um, did a couple of food service contracts here and there, but really got an understanding of the grower uh, packing operations. Um, did that for about a year and a half. And then Newnham's BASF came calling and uh, they said, hey, we want someone for a downstream position. Um, we're a vegetable seed breeder. We got the breeding. We know what, uh, you know, what genetics you know, uh, what the genetics need to be. We have this great catalog of, of uh, you know, different crops or whatever, and uh, we need someone to help um, guide the process further down the chain. So we have the seed to the grower. They want the grower to the end user. So um, that's where my position comes in is uh, marketing, uh, marketing business development. So uh, my crops are lettuce and, and carrots. It's kind of a, a new position, right? Within, I mean, yes. you, I feel like when we talked about this initially, when you described it to me, it was a role that they've never done before in that you work directly with the chefs and the, the big restaurant mm -hmm. businesses to then find what, within Newnham's what could be a fit or what you want to start breeding in the future. Correct. Yep. So they want to stay ahead of the trends um, and even look to uh, what's backlogged. So to your point of this mission being new, um, it, 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 there was a thing they had a, called produce downstream position. The other breeders have this kind of position too, but it wasn't as targeted. They ended up being just seed salespeople. Mm -hmm. um, what they wanted with this position was really to get out and um, it's, heavily relationship based. So rather than just selling seeds to a dealer or to, 
you know, seed procurement at the grower, I'm actually going and talking to their VPs of product development, VPs of marketing and sales and their salespeople and saying, hey, what are you guys hearing in the market? What do you guys see? Oh, you have a need for, um, for example, Wendy's wants uh, um, a more square leaf for their square burger. We actually have something like that, you know, or we have something in the works in, in Spain and maybe we can bring it here. So I'll get on and talk to um, the team in Spain and be like, hey, you know, we're looking for something like this. What do we have? Well, we have this. It, it gets big here, but you know what? It might actually work better in North America for that application. And then we, you know, get seeds uh, to California and we get them, you know, get them in trials. And then it's still kind of a long process, but um, instead of maybe that never happening, now that conversation is happening now because there's a position like me talking to the right people um, instead of letting everything get siloed. Because what I learned from coming from a grower was the growers, the, uh, the production operation, farming staff, still staff, they don't talk as much as you would think, even though they're part of the same organization. Um, so I kind of work on behalf of the grower to help facilitate, um, you know, that pass through from the idea, getting our concept uh, um, into the mix, and then making sure our product development people and everyone are all um, are all on the same page. So, and complicated. And because you have it. that, I guess that global view of what's going on is the trend in food different in what you're seeing in Europe and what you're seeing in California, where they're able, where you're able to look at that and match make between the two climates, or I guess how does that happen? Where you, like the, the example you just gave about the lettuce. It's something where you saw what they were doing in Spain and you thought you could fit it, or it, does it have to go through some alterations to fit the climate in California? Um, usually it comes from past experience of the breeders and the product development people where, um, you know, they'll say, well, you know, Ian, that's what you're looking for. Well, you know, we've run trials of that, you know, three or four or five years ago before I was here. Um, and they said it didn't, it didn't perform to spec of what they were looking for at the time, but because you're looking for that now, oh, well, you know what, that'll actually work. So a lot of what makes my job, what makes me successful in my job or will make me successful in this job is the past experience of the breeders and the product development people that are so incredibly good at what they do. Um, it makes my job like uh, pretty straightforward and like uh, it makes this position successful because of the copious notes, the attention to detail, um, these people travel all over the pl all over the place, um, you know, coming from, you know, from Hungary, you know, S Salinas is such like the salad bowl. I mean, it, it is it is amazing how much um, how much people in Europe uh, are extremely familiar with, you know, Salinas and just the area. Um, it's a very, very heavily traveled. And uh, again, with all these people's experience of coming through here and the varieties they've seen over the years, um, it's simple for me to get on Telegram or WhatsApp have a question and have, we'll wake up the next day with, you know, 20 different answers. So it's, it's a uh, very, 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 very helpful, but that only works because of um, how they've run trials in the past. Got it. And, uh, and one thing we were talking about the other day was how the trend towards smaller lettuce heads has been growing in California. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you saw happen first, maybe in Europe, I think you were saying, um, and so I was wondering if that's continuing to happen or, or what, what's changing about that now? Yeah, so I came into, um, again, my crop focus is, you know, we have a range of, of, uh, of crops, but my, my focus is lettuce, spinach, and carrots. Um, so, you know, they've, over in Europe, they have switched to um, instead of the very large, you know, romaine iceberg green leaf heads, you now have a variety of um, of little gems, midi romaines. Um, not as much bag salad as we have here. We have you go to the 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 store here, and it's just like bag salad everywhere. And then you go look at the whole heads, and it's just it's very very straightforward. You know, you have a couple a couple different items all over there. Um, they've gotten big into the little gems, so little gems taste better. Um, you can grow more densely out in the field. Uh, there's more differentiation, um, you know, and what Newnham's has done as a marketing, uh, marketing tactic is gone into the little gym category and broken out concepts. So there's taste chef's lettuce, which was the square one I was kind of talking about, mm -hmm. um, convenience and technology. So technology is more on the uh, harvesting side. So being able to 
grow certain varieties in a greenhouse and you know harvest it much more efficiently. So whether that's with a machine or you know however they're gonna however whatever works for that specific environment. So different uh, different indoor technology requires different harvesting equipment. So we have uh, varieties that are bred just for indoor varieties versus taking field varieties and trying to grow them indoors and vice versa. We have open field varieties and we have indoor varieties. So uh, within the little gem though, they are uh, breaking it out into concepts and there's a few different varieties that we're featuring in each concept. Um, and they've been pushing this stuff for years. What seems you know novel to me, they're like, oh Ian, we've been trying to do that for five years in the States, you know, but the growers, romaine and iceberg, romaine and iceberg, a little green leaf, a little butter leaf, um, but romaine and iceberg are the are the main you know are the, are the main items. And recently, with the romaine uh, outbreaks of um, of uh, of E. coli, mm -hmm. you have a lot of the growers now op open to some of these new concepts because, like, look, we can't put romaine on the packaging because the retailers, you know, you have so many consumer complaints. It's petered off now, but a lot of the growers still want to try to get away from romaine if they can. Um, because of and that, even though it had nothing to do with the romaine variety, it was just the water, but that's a whole yeah. thing. I was wondering if you get a lot of requests for people interested in breeding for disease resistance, or is it still all about shelf life? Or do you start getting no, more disease. requests for, I guess, like uh, nutritional density or something in crops? Some, I'm wondering, like, what is the trend that you hear coming the most? Disease is a big one. Um, okay. disease is a big one. It doesn't really touch on like what I do as much with downstream because the, um, the retailers, the end users don't, they don't care as much. It's like, well, I don't you know the, the, that's so technical. And even like for me, um, my understanding of it is, is, is limited, but it's because it's, it's kind of handled on the uh, breeding and on the, um, on the very technical side. Mm -hmm. Consumers uh, will expect everything resistance. to be disease free, so that would matter less to them. Well, you're talking about disease like E. coli. That's mm -hmm. that's different than talking about, um, you know, like disease in the field, like, you know, uh, whether it's an aphid or something out of the soil or a, a mineral deficiency or something along those lines. So um, the remarkable thing is that crops are so, because of the breeding and how much has gone into it over these last, well, Nuna's around for 125 years. Just in the last, let's just call it 20, 30 years, um, you have so much less pesticide that is used now because a lot of the plants are very disease resistant. Now, um, to your point about nutrition, a lot of the breeding has been more grower focused. So um, things like flavor and nutrition content were not considerations when they were doing breeding, uh, when they were doing the breeding. So the crosses um, were all centered around um, centered around disease resistance and what the grower wanted to see production out of the field in carrots even more so um, that's why you know carrot flavor is lacking from what it was even probably 10 15 years ago uh, because production it, it's so heavily production based if you're going to breed for shelf life if you're going to breed for disease resistance and production you know and production capacity you're going to lose and and for year round availability uh, year round availability you're going to get a very hardy a much hardier plant that I think is devoid of a lot of the nutrition and flavor um, that we're trying to get back to now. So where, you know, we would spend 0% on breeding for consumer traits. We're now trying to get 30%, just get to 30% of breeding for output traits. Well, that's so, a pretty big shift. Uh, it is. And I mean, I'm not even quite a year into this job and I'm just now starting to kind of get things shifted in that direction. The nice thing is, Consumers king and everyone talks that language now, so it's not it hasn't been as much of an uphill battle. A lot of people want to different and people want to differentiate. You can't differentiate with romaine, iceberg, and spinach <clears throat> um, just on their own. Now it's everyone's got it, and it's a race to the bottom on price. So yeah, and can we talk about carrots? And you kind of blew my mind the other day when you said that car carrots weren't initially orange. Yeah, and I forgot to go back and look up that story, so I can't remember the guy's name. <laughs> we'll, go, we'll go with Pierre. Pierre the Pierre the Orange. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there were, I guess, originally white. I feel like is it white, red, and purple? White, red, and purple. Yep. And the orange was a uh, was like an outlier. So, you know, in uh, fields in France in medieval times, they 
saw an orange, they came across an orange, you know, they had a, a cross in the field that created an orange carrot. And um, that was where we got orange carrots from. So that, I think, I think though it was like the 1500s or something. I think I said like 2000 years ago and that was a gross overestimation. It was uh, 1500, um, I believe is when it was. So. But do you think when we go to the like a, a Rayleigh's or a Whole Foods in the future that there are going to be all the different variety, the rainbow carrots out there that that Newnham's makes, that that will become more popular? Or what's I guess why do we always go with orange? I very much, I very much hope so. Um, Cal Organic has been a great champion um, of you know promoting more esoteric items. Um, it's going to take marketing efforts on our part and um, with some of our our, our third party people to um, get with the retailers and really start to push uh, carrots in this in that in that category to get off of just like you go look at the carrot section now and it's just like orange <laughs> orange bags you know and just orange everywhere so hopefully um, we'll see in the video uh, that I made and I can probably share some of the videos with you um, in the uh, in El Centro uh, back in March right before the travel bans um, were really instated. Was looking in the field at some very at base. It was like what, 250 plots of every single genetic carrot genetic that we have. So I went through and, and it was just myself and one other person because everyone else had to cancel. Um, we tried everything. We had some curly Q pigtail carrots, um, some that had like five different colors in the rings. Um, so you know, I'm we're we're really really hoping to make a push over these next three four years. Um, with the main character of the Grimway and Bolt House to bring some of these new varieties to market to really change that up. Because just like with lettuce, um, there's such a chasm right now of, of, of uh, chasm, right word, but there's just a, such a need to really change that category up because it, there's been nothing done to it um, in years. So it's and been very grower focused. And that would be all driven by the consumer or it's it's kind of the combination of both the grower mm -hmm. producing and putting more out and then the consumer being or a chef i feel like sometimes chefs make foods popular through certain dishes that become I, at big restaurants mm -hmm. and then people start to ask for it or i'm wondering how much of it is something like that versus driven from the grower yeah i mean it's um it's everyone on the uh, supply chain side i i i think there's certain things that lend itself to the consumer um, dictating things. Like you look at uh, delivery, um, you know, delivery packaging types, some of those things are kind of consumer driven, but I think that the retailer and the food service outlets can, and the grow, you know, and us can, can institute change through um, just the right kind of marketing, you know, and just putting, putting the right item out um, at the right time with the right, you know, but, uh, buzzwords of nutrition, convenience. You know, we have lettuce that's very con convenient for lettuce wraps. Um, we have lettuce that's, you know, uh, sweet, you know, that's around taste. Um, what's it, what, what mix of buzzwords and marketing, you know, jargon is it going to be that's, that's going to make this work? And what retailer partner, you know, what's going to work at a Wegmans isn't going to work at Aldi. Um, what works at Gelson's isn't going to work at Dollar General. You know, so it, it, you're going to have to find the right, the right, the right place. And what we're talking about for carrots, it's, it won't be like, oh, this is Walmart is going to sweep, you know, the nation. It's like, no, it might just be a regional thing, you know. Um, at this point, we'll take any win that we can get. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be the gigantic Walmart home run, 72 DCs. You know, it can be just um, four, five wagon stores or something, you know, we'd be happy with. So um, it's picking our battles and being very, very targeted. But um, I think we can educate the consumer and bring some good products and variety um, where there wasn't before. But um, to say that it's strictly the consumer driving it, I, I think there's a way to be targeted with it. No, that makes sense. Um, and then I was curious, so for, for Walmart, do they follow on what becomes the bigger food trends or do they dictate what they want to have in their stores and have special varieties that are Walmart specific or that are, I don't know, I'm wondering if it's like, it's all the way down where there's a planting density that they want. So their growers have a certain yield. So they are assured a certain amount shows up of a certain quality. Like how controlled is that? Um, I mean, Walmart is very um, particular 
about how they go about <laughs> they're the it's there's a reason that they're a global powerhouse and it's because they are um they have very strong um uh, central leadership central organization and um they do a lot of procuring their own seeds um them and Costco they both have that very strong centralized command type setup so they're able to really get on the same page and you know Kundo say hey we want this variety it's just ours this is what we can, we will commit to this amount um here's the three growers that are going to grow it and that's it and then so they've basically controlled it from you know from the genetic side all the way to getting into what stores it's going to go to um because you know supplying all of walmart's demand you're never going to very few growers can really do that um so they pick what growers will go to what dc's um the varieties and again all the way down now um they haven't gotten into that for that's not all crops and not for every single item but um like for things like uh like melons they they do things like that um i believe costco has some uh tomato programs in place i don't get involved in tomatoes so i'm not totally sure um but costco and walmart do that um and again other retailers don't even uh, i think kroger is what the the next one they don't have any programs like that where they're doing anything direct just yet um Safeway Albertsons they don't do anything like that so um it's more uh, decentralized command so uh you know for a Walmart to come in and and really shift things and dictate things yeah they probably could because of just how they run things um mm -hmm. but again we are still at the beginning of this and trying to find the retailer or the food service outlet um whether it's Yum Brands or Brinker you know one of those places that really wants to partner and 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 start to make to make some of these changes yeah i mean when we talked the other day you mentioned that one of the big things that you'd like to see change in the the food system is that you know certain food is available only at certain times and i was wondering mm -hmm. like as you're making these very specific genetics that that are like the sunian i think is an example you mentioned um is there more control over the availability for those and is it kind of shifting the food to to only be in season at certain times of the year or are we going to just having everything available all year round yeah so the the trend now is 52 weeks a year and um i'm sure some growers would be not happy to hear me say well you know 52 week a year supply you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot um you're basically opening up to opening up the expectation to everyone that they need to have it year round well how do i get stuff year round i can't get it out of this ground year round you you know you're going to burn up you know you're going to you're, you're going to burn it out so you're going to have to go elsewhere you're going to have to go you know to exports and now okay well cool now you're opening up everything to exports well now you've got a flooded market you know you've got you know you US is a dumping ground for you know you've heard i don't know if you heard all the issue with tomatoes this past year um and just you know mexico just taking wanting to capture the US dollar well where tomatoes here could be 10 bucks a case mexico's happy with getting 5 bucks a case where do you think they're going to sell that and what do you think retailers are going to do retailers are going to sit there and go uh $10 $5 well i'll go with $5 you know my labor costs are high my whatever you know and that's not, i'm picking on retailers but that's <laughs> food service as well it's not like it that's just you know the produce supply chain encompassing right. everyone is going to go to that so go to that cheaper variety especially on commodity items where the differentiation isn't that much you know if um grown in US or grown in Mexico is the differentiator and you're saving dollars you know at the store or at the restaurant level what are you going to do you know and right. it's not I mean a, the majority of consumers the it is. aren't going to differentiate when they're picking out the produce I mean I've heard it from several people I feel like when I talk to the folks at Whole Foods they mentioned this that at the end of the day people may talk a lot about organic or where things are grown um but that majority 85 to 90% of it is just people aesthetically being drawn to something and picking it up and so the margin probably is um pretty important to them on how they make that decision Yeah it absolutely is and and with everything that's changing now um you know when i look at even my like what i was saying you know looking at my notes for this and looking at food service trends and what's going on who who knows i mean how, what's going to be subsidized after this restaurants can't survive on 25% capacity if that's what they're allowed to open up to um they're going to have to look to other things so um 
it's really, really tough to say, but I think if we, you know, if we can get to buying more in season, buying more domestic and, you know, we're talking about more domestic things, more domestic production of other items, not just produce, but just, you know, things being made here overall. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it'll, I think it'll be positive um, to, to the point with the Sunion. One of the things that made Sunion successful, and I had conversation with the marketing company last week that brought it to market with the, with us and the, the, the two main growers. What made it super successful was they maintained exclusivity. So they limited acreage, they limited seed availability and who could, who could grow it. And I mean, I remember it came to the stores here in Ventura County and um, man, they had a nice big display. The marketing was, you know, was, was very, very pretty. Um, pretty, that's a horrible word. Uh, was very, I need to find a better word than pretty. Uh, <laughs> eye catching, thank you. Um, uh, it was just a very nice display. The, the packaging was clean and neat and um, it was there. Everyone bought it. You, you could see the people coming out trying it and then coming back the next day and it was gone. Um, even my extremely picky mother, um, who's always uh, incredulous of the things that I recommend to her. She loved them. Um, I was very impressed by them. Not so much just the tearlessness of them, mm -hmm. uh, but just the overall flavor. It's just a great, uh, it, it hits all the marks and um, they maintained that exclusivity. And that was what, uh, what the marketing company really ascribes to it being as successful as it was. It fetched a premium sold out we sold out all the seed the growers don't have any backlog and now we get ready for the next season to come around and everyone's going to be waiting for them um my example of it not going well was is cotton candy grapes i don't know if you've ever had cotton candy grapes before but I remember when they came out on the food service side years ago um they were they were incredible they were a rage of 100 bucks a case there was so much sugar in them the bags were like it was like maple syrup like they were just amazing um and huge in food service hotels, amenities loved them. Um, then, re then, then retail caught on. Now they're available much more throughout the year and they don't have peak times of the year. Yeah, they're very good, but the rest of the time of the year, they just taste like a regular grape. So, um, and they don't fetch a premium that they used to. So I think that's an example of, um, of maintaining ex exclusivity and where, it, where, it's, where it's a win and where it, um, where it, where it shows you can you can get into that trouble of okay well now we just have another commodity item you know right like it's I feel like it waters down the brand of what was cotton candy grapes because mm -hmm. you I mean I wouldn't even know what time is in season for grapes July June the summertime yeah yeah because yeah. you can get them now year round mm -hmm. um I was wondering if you get a lot of interest in, from folks in California that want varieties that use less water. Huh. Mm, I mean, or no. there's always a consideration. Yeah. Um, I'm not as, I'm going to, I can, I can give my, my educated, uh, my limited educated guess on it is that yes, because it's water is a, uh, a hot commodity here. Although we've come out of our drought in California, mm -hmm. we have really good snowpack. So um, not quite as much of an issue, but um mm -hmm. The varieties on the breeding side, I don't, I can't water, I, it, it maybe on the hydro much. side, yeah, but on the field side, I don't, uh, water isn't really as much of a consideration. Now, someone might be able to correct me on that, um, but as far as I know, water's not a, anything that gets the bread, you know, yeah. water resistance or needing less water. I mean, crops, crops as they, as they are now are pretty efficient, so, um, you know, the, uh, the nut growers in California take up most of the water, uh, the conversation around water because almonds are such a huge crop here and they take so much water. So mm -hmm. um, field, open, open field crops don't get the- The same, yeah, don't you don't the hear the same crop. things. Mm -hmm. um, we started talking a bit about, you know, the, trans, the trend in, you know, no one's eating at restaurants right now. I think year over year restaurant sales are down like 78% or something I heard the other day, but that, yeah. There is this upward trend in take, take out and delivery. I think it's like 50% up year over year, the reverse of it almost. And so yeah. if you were starting to get pulled in the direction of people thinking about products that do better 
when they're delivered rather than served at a restaurant or if that takes time to change as well. Yeah, and um, you know, I try to keep my ear to the ground with packaging. Um, over mm -hmm. in Europe, it's very, very popular to, because over there, they're much more into, and have been for a longer time, into eco-friendly packaging. Um, so over o overseas, there's there's a lot of collaboration, collaboration with people from my department and packaging companies. And here, um, you know, I've come across a product recently um, that isn't, uh, it's an ad, it's a little, it's like a, a desiccant pack that gets added to takeout and delivery containers and it basically normalizes the humidity to ambient so it doesn't get soggy the the food will stay fresh the way it is longer which um especially for restaurants that are like more of the the finer dining type restaurants don't like doing takeout because that food is made so delicately and, and plated in such a way that it's made to be you know, plate it up and then consumed within a few minutes. So you can't mm -hmm. stuff it into a container and then take it home. Um, you know, it, it's not made, the food isn't made for that, you know, so um, finding options for those types of restaurants, because they're going to be the ones that are hit the hardest with the um, capacity restrictions is finding packaging and packaging uh, items that will make their food, uh, you know, hold up to the delivery and to the takeout because that's going to be the normal for a while here because restaurants aren't going back to 100% capacity. Um, you, whatever your opinion is of it, it's not going to happen for a little while. So, right. Um, so yeah, so looking at items, so breeding for shelf life, we've, they've been doing that for a long time. Shelf life is what it is. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. I don't know that you can breed for any more shelf life. Stuff lasts I just drank, I just finished a gallon of milk that expired on the first and it was still good. So, um, you know, just, you know, um, things hold up you know, really, really well. Carrots, you know, the, those things all hold up very, very well. So shelf life, I think is kind of max. If we breed for any more shelf life, I think you're going to start seeing even if we're breeding for output traits, which are um, taste, nutrition, convenience, color, um, you're going to lose those things in trying to get shelf life. So um, I think looking to the packaging industry, uh, packaging companies, packaging marketing to find options to do that. And then we can focus more on the nutrition side and, um, uh, you know, those other output traits versus just straight up shelf life because shelf life, um, we've kind of hit that mark, you know, bags yeah. out the last two weeks from when the, you know, from when it gets to the, uh, to the retailer to, to being consumed. It'll last about two weeks. That's a long time. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing salad. that it lasts that long and it's that hardy from the fields yeah. all yeah. the way to when consumers get it. Ian, we've um, I've had a great time chatting, but we've had a couple of questions come in. Um, so I just wanted to read what's, do you see flavor companies being part of this co-creation or more restaurant food vendor industries? Read that to me again. Do you see flavor companies? I think, it, um, like a, a ferment, sure. There's some companies that produce, I guess, the flavors that go into food. Um, being part of this co-creation oh. or more restaurant food vendor industries. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean that's uh, yes. Sorry. Um, yes, I think that would be fantastic because what we're coming into now is this is all new. You know, so any any kind of co-creation we can do um, is something that we're really all about, especially something like that. So collaborating with a company that doesn't do what necessarily what we do, but is in the same vein of what we're trying to do, um, mm -hmm. especially because most people haven't worked with the seed genetics company before, even for me, I never heard of Newnums, but then you get in, you're like, oh my God, I've been eating Newnums genetics for years. You know, it's one of the, it's one of the top four companies, you know, in, in, in vegetable seed genetics. So, um, you know, you get in and it's kind of one of those things you're like, oh, this is like one of those companies where it's like, you know, you've never heard of it before, but they're everywhere. So, um, yes, that would be fantastic. And I'm going to steal that idea <laughs> and uh, take credit for it. So thank you. The anonymous attendee. And then we have another question. What are some significant tensions that you have to navigate when breeding for food service? Flavor versus longevity, for example, how do you choose what is most important to support? You know, um, and I think that's the beautiful thing about where I'm at is getting to consider all those options because you're going to talk to different people and what flies somewhere else is not going to fly 
in another spot. So um, I think looking at what people want um, specifically, you know, what, what, you know, what Taco Bell is going to want to institute is going to be different from like a Mastro steakhouse, you know, what, what they're going to want to do. So what I like, what I really liked about my job previously in working in restaurants with different chefs was getting to have that option and is to be like, look, we have, we have a range of products here. I'm not just trying to shove one product down your throat. I am, I am wanting to have you come and we're going to collaborate together and we're going to find a solution versus just being beating you over the head as a, as a seed sales person, which isn't my job. You know, mm -hmm. I want to, and as a company culture, we want to find those products. We don't, it's been grower driven for years. They now want to take that step back and say, look, it's now a consumer market. We have decades and we have all this information, um, you know, over the years, we can now, how do we apply all that? We have this huge backlog of all, like, like I was saying earlier, I can text a few people and get all kinds of information back. All this information is there. We just need the ability to get it out. So whether it's someone wanting a longer shelf life, someone wanting more flavor, somebody wanting some, somebody wanting something that is, uh, uh, you know, harvestable, uh, a new harvesting machine for indoor channel system. Cool. We'd have an option for that, you know, um, not, not to be limited by one or two traits or one or two customers being able to, to sell to everyone. Got it. And I think this is the last question, but can we get a glimpse of trends coming down the road in the next decade or so? Yeah, so I mean, what's gone on with COVID has kind of thrown a wrench into a lot of things because what we thought were trends before or were important before, now everything's being reprioritized. So, um, uh, you know, we're still, as far as I can see on the lettuce side and with the customers, all the big growers that I've talked to that are our customers, um, they still want to stick with innovating. They want to um, have options. They want to have a romaine alternative. They want to have more convenience type lettuce. So individual, single leaf, like for burger leaf, for wraps. Um, I'm hoping you're going to see those kits start popping up here in the near future. I've been working on a couple different projects with um, some of our little gems, multi-leaf, and even some of our baby ice, uh, new baby iceberg variety. Probably shouldn't tell you guys all that. <laughs> proprietary, but um, these things are coming. So um, I think uh, you'll see much more convenience snacking with lettuce. You're going to see lettuce as Lettuce is kind of like what the carrot was 10 years ago. I'm hoping to have that over, over these next couple of years is to have snacking lettuce available, so. Awesome, we'll have to, there. yeah, look for it at the grocery store. Thanks Ian so much for spending time with us today. Um, just uh, this webinar will be up on our website, www.arable.com farming backslash farming fast and slow. And we will have information about next week's episode where I think Adam and Walter will be discussing Jupyter Notebooks and I hope you can join us. Thanks again, Ian. Thank you.